I haven't seen this episode just yet, but this is courtesy of the account Elephant Graveyard, which I already said to you before, deserves way more fucking subscriptions than they already have. Please subscribe to Elephant Graveyard. They're flipping fantastic. They've got a new video called This Is A Sad Thing, The D Desolation Of Shorb. Um, a few people sent this to me via the DM, so big up all of you who sent this to me. We're going to check this out, actually, before I... Shall I move this? Oh, why is this camera always weird? Boy, bear with me one second whilst I... Make sure this camera isn't doing madness to me right now. This one's always a weird one for some reason. Let's just move it there. Move it there. And then move this one over here. Let's see if that works. No, that works, right? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Cool. So, a little bit centered there. So, let's watch this and see what I'll go on for this one. The Desolation of Shorb. Courtesy of Elephant Graveyard. We've got loads of other things to kind of get through. Let's start with this first. Oh, was that? No, sorry, sorry. I got I saw a question. Oh, actually, whoops. Let me get a chat up on here. I saw a question here. Uh, P09 Bala says, What did you think about Mount to Man United? I talked about it on my main podcast, the Excellent Zinger Show, which should be out soon. So check out for my full recap there. But to give you an overview, I'm not happy with it in the slightest. Um, I'm one of the rare fans out here who thinks that our lack of structure, our lack of actual good owners, our lack of overall, you know, stringent, fucking sporting vision is why we're at where we're at. I don't think our fortunes are going to be changed with signing. So if it's up to me as a United fan, Fan, I would say I wouldn't want any player sold and I wouldn't want any player signed until the sale and takeover um, has been concluded. I don't care who buys the club, Sir, Rat Sir Jim Ratcliffe or the um, Sheikh Jassim. Obviously, I'd prefer Sheikh Jassim because it's a 100% purchase. But personally, I don't see any point in buying players until the takeover and sale has been concluded because essentially you're signing a player under one regime and then another regime is going to come in who might have different ideas. They might even have a new manager in place who knows what's going to happen so you're going to be um you know um leaving them with players that they don't necessarily want and there's one thing we know about united we find it very difficult to sell players anyway especially english players we can't seem to get any good money out of them so i think signing mount is a mistake number two i don't necessarily rate him i think his best years for me personally have gone i think the 2021 mason mount is not the same player that he is now i don't think he's a big um upgrade from christian erickson and i also think his best attribute abuse off the ball which is running and I don't want runners I want players that are technically pressure on the ball that's what we're going to get to challenging the likes of Man City and all the best clubs in Europe by having technically professional football players we're not going to get there by having people that can smash the bleep test so I'm not a fan of that in the slightest or whatsoever um, and obviously I think we overpaid for him 60 million for Mason Mount is too much at most he's a 40 million pound player even with English tax and paying him 220,000 a week is insane bits of money he's not going to get that anywhere else any other club in the world so as per usual our negotiating team don't know what they're doing we overpaid for him we don't need him and we should really concentrate on the sale of the club mostly but i'll talk about that on my main show the excellent digging show you can check that out on my channel when that gets uploaded anyway let's get back to the video is there such thing as insanity among penguins could they just go crazy because they've had enough of their colony well i've never seen a penguin bashing its head against a rock. They do get disoriented. They end up in places they shouldn't be. Now that like we know what we're doing and know what I'm looking at, I could see, like I would start to figure out, I was like, oh, this person sold tickets because they're famous. You can end up being like, well, if I'm known enough, I can, you can like get away with it. Honestly, that is, he really didn't take enough. He didn't take, uh, no, he didn't, um, no, you know, exploit it. What's the right way to say? Uh, he didn't make the most out of this opportunity. You know? The whole Showtime thing. Look how he came out, bro. Look at how he came out. Look at that stage. Schwab, all lit up. The LEDs, the um, massive theatre. Has he ever performed in a place this big ever since, you know, filming You'd Be Surprised in the first place? I don't think so. He really did take this for granted, man. He legitimately took that shit for granted. He should have made more out of it end up being like well if i'm known enough i can you can like get away with it when i see like the like a celebrity comic pop in I'm like you're gonna eat shit on you this show shit. and, I and they do you realize that you can't and it's also funny too because if you remember around that sort of time when brendan was filming you'd be surprised he was really really stressing about his outfit 
saying that he's been planning it for months in advance. And this was when he was trying to cosplay as this guy who was into fashion, into clothes, when, you know, he just looks like a teenager, really. He's not really into fashion, really, in a wider scheme of things. He doesn't really wear anything interesting outside of his trainers, really. But he was stressing about his outfit, allegedly, for the show. And he just turned up in, like, a shiny jacket, skinny jeans, some Jordans. All of that fucking hype. All of that build up and he just showed up like how he usually dresses up anyway. So it was like, what was the big fashion statement thing he was meant to make? No suit. He didn't wear a kilt. Like nothing. Just like a regular bomber jacket, black t-shirt, black jeans and trainers. Don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong with his outfit, you know, technically. But it's just funny that he made such a big deal out of it and he turns up in some regular Tom Segura type of outfit. And end up like you at the comic store, you'll see them to pop in. Like, that's a look. That, that, sorry, I keep pausing. I know, I know, I know. You can end up like you at the comic That's a that he thought he arrived, man. That's what, and again, I don't actually like, I'm one of the only people who don't mind this, like, because I know the talents and the ability that I have, right? So I'm, 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 I'm kind of certain in my head, which is really bizarre, but I'm certain in my head that I'm a really good DJ, like, really, really good at what I do. But I also know. I'm a nobody. No one fucking knows who I am. No one gives a fuck about me. Cool. No worries. But I'm also a dead cert. If you gave me the opportunity to play at some of these big clubs in the world, I wouldn't embarrass myself. I'd show up and I'd, sh I'd show up and turn up. Like I'd, I'd impress people. I'd be like, oh shit, I belong here, right? It would sound like I should be here and I'd maybe build up from that platform. So I think that's what Brendan should have done. It's all well and good faking it till you make it. But when you get your chance, you need to fucking run with it. You don't, you shouldn't just like fake it to make it think you've arrived. Because that's the face of somebody who thinks they've arrived. He already thought the hard work was done. Now just sit back and collect all the dollars. You know, that's what he basically did. That's why he fucked up. And, you see them and also not being funny. Pop in. Yeah. And they're sandwiched between real comics. You're like, oh. Because I would always try to go like, am I writing better material? Correct. Yeah. Am I scoring enough touchdowns yeah. to win games? Yeah. Are they laughing? Am I selling tickets? The difference in the in the, the background between that uh, the you be surprised and uh, Gringo Papi is hilarious. You can choose to be as delusional as you want to be, and we see oh, yeah. right in front of us the delusional people. <laughs> All right. What do you guys think of that podcast? Do you think Tom Segura was talking about Brendan to Brendan without him realizing, or do you think that caricature, that person who was describing that avatar, um, that archetype? Uh, it's something that you can maybe ascribe to a lot of people in the comedy industry. I think the latter. I think many people can fit that description of Brendan Shaw because I think because comedy is such a, it's like DJing. It's the lowest barrier of entry. DJing, as much as I think I'm amazing, I don't deny it's the lowest barrier of entry to get into the music industry. So if you have no talent, if you can't rap, if you can't sing, if you can't write music, if you can't play an instrument, the nearest way to kind of being on a stage and being in front of people and performing is to be a DJ. So because of that, there's a lot of people that are shit. So I think the same happens in stand-up. If you can't act and you can't read lines and you can't write, maybe stand-up is the nearest you're going to get from to be like a star on stage by yourself. So I think that description that Tom was throwing out there, even though it was a bit of a troll, I think it can fit loads of people. It's not just a Brendan thing, personally. And I think at that time... Brennan was also in the good graces of Joe. I don't think Tom would want to purposely piss him off. Hit it. Sounds very glamorous and like aspirational to say things like, I'm going to bet on myself to win. <laughs> but the reality is, man, that's a lonely road. That's a difficult road. And that's a road that is not supposed to work. And the funny thing about this thing that Luke Thomas is saying of betting yourself that Brendan said, it's okay to bet on yourself. Right? Sometimes you need to if you don't have enough opportunities. But Brendan has never been a bet on yourself type of person. His whole career has been co-signed, introductions, recommendations. Like he's used, that's kind of been one of the hallmarks of his success. The ability to network, use his contacts to kind of get him further in his career than maybe his talent deserves him to be. So to suddenly then turn around and pretend, no, 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 I'm the bet on myself type of guy. I'm going to try to get out from the mud. We know the truth. We'd be like, uh, you're just doing that because no one wants to work with you anymore. You know, now you're doing it. Now you're pretending to be like the working from the bottom, coming up, doing on my own because there's no other option. Why do you bet on yourself? You bet on yourself because other people don't. People exactly. People who bet on themselves 
more often than not fall flat on their face. It's, it's a really lonely, difficult path to walk, and he walked it and he ended up here. What up, guys? It's your favorite bee sting in the rat king. The wait is. Oh, shit. I've got to put a chat there. Guys, you should have told me to put a chat on the screen. Um, good, good point here by. Um, sorry, I've got to put a chat on the screen. Good point here by Young Old Vibes. I never thought about that, actually. Young Old Vibes says most comics just started making money with podcasting and they don't know how to handle it. So they come off as arrogant psychos. I definitely agree. I think a lot of comics, a lot of those guys weren't selling tickets before podcasting came around and then suddenly they all found an avenue to promote themselves and to sell tickets you know to promote themselves the comedy and to sell tickets naturally right and if you're a real comic comic no matter how much money you make from stand-up what you really love is to go on tour be able to smash underage girls cheat on your wife or your husband <laughs> eat loads of fucking chicken fingers and live that kind of life i mean that's what you really like so you use this podcasting as a way to kind of funnel that sort of thing so it's no surprise that they're all going a bit loopy but sometimes i can sometimes have sympathy for those guys because i feel like it must be difficult also for these guys to you're suddenly famous when you're like in your mid 50s or like late 40s and stuff it must be difficult to kind of handle to from going to be like a nobody to suddenly people giving a shit about you you know like it can be difficult to kind of figure that out it's difficult enough when you're a teenager imagine when you're a grown-up adult you've got a regular job no one cared about you you were getting 10 plays on your specials and now suddenly people are caring about you you've got fucking hello fresh you know ads coming out of your ass hundred thousand views on your podcast money coming in by the wazoo like i get why they go a bit crazy anyway let me stop pausing this stuff too much i'm really doing the worst reactions in the world let me let it play a bit more Nearly over the podcast like you guys have never seen before that you're going to help create. Right. Break it down for deal. I got some sad news. Uh, I'm going to be taking a, a step back from being on uh, King and the Sting. And, uh, Sorry, Brandon. You know, uh, I'm grateful to you, Brandon, man. I appreciate it. You should start doing cocaine. We stay on the show if I do. <laughs> um, I don't want to do it alone. I'm fucking lonely. It's lonely. Yeah, I mean, it's sad, you know. <laughs> I feel sad about it, you know. Um, <laughs> that shit with Brendan, though, was fucking crazy. That whole thing was just fucking absolutely retarded. So special, man. Yeah. Theo's so special. It is very And you just cool. know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you just know it, man. With Theo, it's like he's the LeBron James that got me so creative. I'm just that shitty coach on the side. Trying to manage this ball game. <laughs> Not to fuck it up, man. For old times, we should have done this in the middle of the show, but for old times, we maybe want to eat, I'll eat a hot chip. I don't want that. <laughs> I mean, I'm down. I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want to do it alone. It's fucking lonely. It's lonely. lonely. It's fucking mm -hmm. lonely and a bore. Between the whiskey, the network, stand up, the merch, branding deals. It's like, I'm tired, man. I'm sick of dealing with myself. I do everything myself. I'm yeah. tired. Yeah. Tired, man. I'm tired. Man. Theo's doing his thing. Theo's doing his thing, <laughs> so, you know, we're figuring it out. Turn camera. This is really good. I don't know who this person is. Maybe you can educate me in the chat. But I love this. How they kind of mirror each other in this scene. Whether this person is on the right-hand side, this old footage. This is pretty cool, man. Eric C, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Just do anything. Faster, faster. Oh, is it? It's, it's Orson Wells, is it? Okay, cool. It's such a good scene. How they've made it mirror each other. You know? Fosters. Fosters. Fights coming up. You have big UFC pay per views. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook. <laughs> Listen, I'm not great at trucking and stuff like that. I actually have a small throat, despite the rumors. Ready? Here we go. Dude, Theo, who's not here today, this one legit. This may be one of the saddest things, you know. This shoey he was doing, with a with a three D printed shoey, on set alone in front of Chin by himself with no friends. Part of the fun of a shoey is that you're kind of doing it around people, right? 
you maybe take someone else's shoe, a friend's shoe, a stranger's shoe, but you're kind of like in a group environment, kind of like doing beer pong, right? Not, you don't want to play beer pong on your own. You want to play in a group environment. And the fact that he's doing it by himself like this is so sad, man. Concerned because yesterday, you know, when I do my shows, I drink. He's like, dude, I, I know we joke, over, uh, joke around about intervention, stuff like that. California champagne. <laughs> but for you to drink on most of the shows, yeah. it's concerning. That's amazing. <laughs> look at the, look at the. I know you can't see it here, but I'm gonna quickly zoom in and lift it up. Look at that. Redacted by Los Angeles Police Department. Case number. <laughs> Active investigation over Crystalia's face is fucking incredible. I love it. We got the elephant graveyard. You smashed it. Because I've been, I've been there, man. You're drinking to get through. Also, someone show. Yeah. Someone needs to tell Brennan to stop doing his face. This face is really unflattering. It makes him look awful, man. It's concerned. This face he does that. He always does this on like thumbnails and shit. Like, what is this face he loves to pull? There's like. It's not funny, not comedic. It just makes him look like a fucking melted candle or something. It's awful, man. It kind of looks like he's, his Botox is failing. I don't know what it is, but whoever, if you know Brendan and you're friends with him, please tell him to stop pulling his face. It's not funny. It doesn't make him look cute. And if anything, it, looks, it makes him look horrendous. Because I've been, I've been there, man. You're drinking to get through it because you hate it. I was like, oh, no. You're drinking whiskey? Yeah, I'm doing better than that. <laughs> you have alcoholism. Oh, no. Now we're in serious business here. This is really something. This, you see, though, could be an awful problem. Let's suppose that you have some difficult and distressing habit, like drinking too much. Once you've become the victim of this... But to be fair to him, though, in recent years or recent weeks, maybe he's doing it off stream or off network, but I don't think so because I think his face is thinned out a little bit because I think alcohol does that when you stop drinking booze for a while. Even a short period, your face usually thins out quite a bit. I think Brendan stopped drinking as much. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm being a bit too charitable, but I think he hasn't drunk as much as I've seen him before. He's been a little bit more well-behaved in that regard. He's still obviously smashing those terrible rain air energy drinks that's just full of sugar, but he's definitely not pounding as much whiskey as he was beforehand. This habit. It's an extraordinarily difficult thing to get rid of it. And it requires intense <laughs> willpower. <laughs> so that kills you right off. You're a dead duck from then on. Never took a opiate? <laughs> Drinking whiskey. <laughs> One PM yeah. on Monday. You start with it. What's up with this whiskey, man? You want some? Come on, we gotta come on. That's why I'm here. When man. people start drinking in the morning, you know they're off the rails. That's why I, I got a friend who's drinking in the mornings now. You want some? Yeah, I hate. I know I say hate, but just my kind of like unpopular opinion. As I think, if I'm Joe Rogan's friend and he keeps doing this type of shit, it would annoy me. Where he kind of talks about you on his podcast without mentioning your name. And hoping you kind of hear it. Like, I'm, I wouldn't be a fan of that. If I'm, if I'm your friend, like, tell me directly. If I don't listen, then fair enough, you're going to get through to me, cool. But I feel like he does this a lot with a lot of people. He kind of does this kind of like, I'm not going to mention the name of the person. But if you know who you, you know, you probably figure out it's you he's talking about. He does it a lot with people on this show. <laughs> 12 on a Monday. Butch, yeah, well, yeah, scotch yeah. on the table. Butch, no, you don't know how many families are destroyed. <laughs> how many fucking jobs were lost because of alcohol. Like, That's a weird point to make. Like, look how many families are fine. His face looks weathered. He looks 20 years older. He's just deteriorating right in front of our eyes. Drinks to the point that he is hallucinating and thinks that he sees people attacking. How many, how many people drink are fine? The majority. I'm genuinely worried. Really? Fuck! Oh. When he gets mad, he gets more aggressive. What are you going to do, dude? In Hindu or Buddhist terms, liberation is getting out of the toils of karma. It's like this. During your many past lives, you've done all kinds of deeds, good and bad, and you are reaping the consequences of these deeds today. I had a roommate who was, I'm not going to fight you. I'm like, that's not an option, man. Luki right in his face. Grabbed him by his sweatshirt, threw him through our glass door, shattered our glass door. Katie and Ida, who got Gary by that fire, she liked the with a dick taste. I think you're the mental health shit. I'll hear that story one more time and slip my Just fucking wrist. Whiskey on his lap. Your fiance passed away. Yeah? Not something one time. All this stuff is just happening in the last year or so, isn't it? So much shit has happened, bro. He's like a magnet for drama and just nonsense, isn't it, Brendan? Fucking hell, brother.
I am a journalist. I'm good now, no. <laughs> uh, guys, what do you mean I'm dying jumping in? alcoholism and you're complaining about the shape of his eyes? You ruined this human being's livelihood, you fucking pieces of shit. That's right. You've ruined him. That's right. This it's delicate awesome human body. being. They don't care. Brandon Shaw. I hate the name of his whiskey. Headlining the Moon Tower. That, this legitimately was my favorite arc of Brendan Shaw when he's just lied without any encouragement about headlining the Moon Tower Comedy Festival. It flipping made me die with laughter. I couldn't believe it because in my opinion, the fact that he got booked in the first place to perform there amongst the hundreds of thousands of people performing was a good thing. The fact that he was booked alongside Sarah Silverman, who's on here, um, David Spade, Andrew Santino, Bobby Lee, Big J Okerson, Dan Soda, Mark Norman, like that should be a win in itself. The fact that he's on the same lineup as his people is a win. But he couldn't, you know, that wasn't enough. So he took the advantage because I think he was one of the first people to be announced. They had his name in big, bold and high up on the list. He just then, you know, ran with the idea that he was headlining. It's like, bro, you know you're not headlining. Why are you lying? And then eventually, he ended up completely cancelling because I think, you know, he just got, you know, cold feet. Or if I'm not mistaken, the story goes, he didn't sell enough tickets at his particular little bit. So they basically cancelled it. And then he didn't turn up. Or maybe the ticket sales are too low. He didn't want to be embarrassed in front of his peers. And he just didn't show up. But this was the funniest period ever because it was such an unnecessary lie. And in the end, he doesn't show up. Typical. Comedy Chicago, one night only Den Theater. It's too much head injuries. Moon Tower Comedy Festival. It's the worst fucking name ever. They don't care. They don't oh, care. no, they're laughing about it. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not a human being. being. They're laughing about it. It's a bad name. They, What's the name? Tiger, Tiger Fit. Fit. He's called with a better name. It's embarrassed to tell people what it is. Austin, Texas, we changed venues. And you've ruled this fucking guy's career. I mean, you might not have the best stand-up, but I don't, I don't think I'm at that level where I can go to Louis C.K. or Andrew I think you are. I really didn't take sales last night, but they're different. Yeah, but, no, Tom, this is what's weird. Um, heard, if I don't see my kids, I can't do the show, do <laughs> Uh, look at the look at the post when he cancelled it cancelled sorry austin i'll be announcing a full week and uh, asap for 2022 i won't be able to make it this saturday so allegedly it was like a kids thing he got homesick and didn't want to be and didn't want to leave his kids when we all know you know he's joked about it before which has been ha ha he he not funny not so funny where he said hey he you know sometimes he'd booked tours weeks or months in advance to get away from the family which i don't think is that uncommon i think a lot of stand-up comedians do it um naturally a lot of these guys hate their partners wives and girlfriends and shit cool it is what it is it's annoying it's upsetting it's sad to see and whatever maybe but it is what it is so i don't think it's unique in that respect but then to suddenly turn around and, and pretend like you are somehow attached to the hip of your kids and you just can't be away from them and da, 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 da. bro you perform on sundays you know what I mean? Like, you, you, you run away on tour as soon as possible when you need to be. And all of a sudden, it's like, I can't be away from my kids. Hand on chest, I'm being honest. Hand on chest, I'm being honest. That's official. I have to cancel my theater show in Chicago. My <laughs> show this Friday has been... He cancels so often. And the thing is about it as well, I think for the Friday Kids subreddit people, no one actually cares that he cancels, right? Because, you know, selling tickets is difficult. We all know it. If you've ever put on, if you've ever organized an event for your friends, you know, you try to get your friends to come out to dinner, you try to organize a little party, you know how hard it is to get people out of the house, let alone to get people to buy tickets with their hard earned money. It's hard, it's difficult. We know this. Everyone doesn't sell tickets. Only a small, you know, select group of comedians can actually sell out consistently. Cool, whatever. But he actually wears his pride or brags about being such a big deal, pretends he's such a big deal then takes the piss out of other people who don't sell and mocks them in some way. And then he's also the person that that cancels more often than others, always cancelling. And most likely you'd imagine his reasonings for cancelling are probably worse than others because it's quite clearly a case of him just not coming, not coming close to selling amount of tickets that would make the event make sense. That's what happened most likely with his UK Euro tour. He booked these massive theatres and these theatres probably just their running costs require you to sell a certain amount. Maybe it's 1,000 tickets and he couldn't even sell 500 in some venues. So, of course, they had to cancel them, which is probably more embarrassing. Um, you know, then probably just crawling over the line of 1,000. You can't even get close to 1,000 and you have to cancel it. 
So if he was just a bit more humble and didn't brag so much about ticket sales or make it to be so much part of his main identity, no one would really be ragging on him about it because I think loads of comics don't sell tickets. As somebody else made a comment on here before, I don't think most of these stand-ups made sold tickets before they did podcasts anyway. Um, they were all struggling. So he's not unique in that bit. But he just needs to be a bit more humble. Canceled. You have winter uh, advisory. You got Omicron. You have school shut down. I had to reschedule my San Francisco dates because they recalled the district attorney. Oh my God. Imagine recalling, using the excuse that they're recalling the district attorney as reason why you can't Brendan Shaw perform in San Francisco is fucking obscene. Fair enough if Dave Chappelle said it because they're protesting outside of his show because of his trans jokes and stuff. Fair. But Brendan Shaw, of all people, come on, the DA. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a blessing that Moon Tower uh, didn't work out because now I can stay home. And here he's heading off into the interior of the... Yeah, Natashki, yeah, for sure. I think he could do a Euro tour in clubs. I said it before. Um, no, sorry, not Natashki. I think Josie said it. Um, I said it before. I think if Brendan did the Euro tour in like 500 cap clubs, the novelty of Brendan coming over as an American, as somebody associated with Joe Rogan and all that stuff and UFC MMA, he could easily sell 500 tickets for sure in my opinion because i think one of the dates in scotland actually he sold about 400 um but then if you look at the numbers really and you investigate them you'll see there was a lot of people there um saying i think on a subreddit that a lot of those tickets were purchased by scalpers allegedly that's what happens when somebody big on quote unquote somebody well known from america comes over in the uk or whatever books a date a lot of ticket scalpers resellers will buy a bunch first and then resell them later. So a lot of the early ticket sales aren't really reflective of how many actual people are buying it, which is quite, you know, deceptive. But I still think if he did club tours in the UK, he could, he could sell out some venues, especially if he did a couple, if he just did like, you know, one day in, you know, Robin, one day in Ireland, one day in Glasgow, one day in Manchester, one day in London, he would smash it personally in that respect. But again, it would require planning, a bit of humility to kind of go down to that level, would it, would it make sense financially to fly all those hours over here to play at 500 cap venues? I'm not too sure. Vast continent. I heard this thing today and Pat Militich was saying we told Hamzat not to make weight because we weren't selling tickets. It was agreed to way before that he was going to come in 180 pounds, I think. You know how fucking stupid you have to be to even <laughs> think something like that. I just think it wasn't trending well. They had this plan B. This, this is a good setup from Dana. He knew all along that it was Brendan, but he set it up so perfectly, man. This Dana's a piece of shit. And I don't like the guy. And he's, I think, demonstrably a bad thing for the UFC. And the moment he leaves, it'll be better for everybody. Um, especially when it comes to fire, pain, all that stuff, whatever. Cool. But he really played Brendan ex expertly here. He knew exactly who he was talking about. So I'm not pulling this out of my ass. He has to be the dumbest motherfucker on the planet. 5,000 kilometers ahead of him, he's heading towards certain death. I believe that was Brendan Shaw who said that. Oh, it wasn't Pat Militich? I think so. I, I apologize to Pat Militich then. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> One of the greatest mic drops of all time. That makes sense. And that then purported, that made Brendan write a whole fucking novel on his Instagram account, a massive caption trying to get back at him like, fucking excellent. That makes sense. <laughs> That's all it took. <laughs> That's a great commercial. <laughs> to be fair, I think that's the best way to hurt somebody. If you really dislike, because I think Brennan's still got a bit of a hate burner from Dana. But if you really dislike somebody and you're both public figures, refusing to mention their name, right, or to actually directly acknowledge them is going to really hurt them way more than going back and forth. Because since Brendan, like, you know, I think he won first. Brendan definitely was up 1-0. When he let, when he kind of called him Eskimo brothers and shit, right? He did him that well there. But ever since then, I think Dana's won a lot of their exchanges simply from just not responding or responding that way. You know, like I think that works really well. Isn't that great? I love it, Mark Zuckerberg. Let me ask this: Name ten UFC fighters. He can't. There's only one former UFC fighter headlining comedy shows, selling out theaters and uh, clubs. It's me. You gotta go after a guy who's not doing well. You gotta go after a guy who can't sell tickets. Thanks, dude. I'm trying on, on the right track. Think of comedy, think of me. Look, Brendan's my boy, but he needs a handler. Brendan needs a handler. Do I? I don't need a handler. These guys need a handler. 
rich, rich, privileged fox. Come here, let me talk to you. I need a handler. They need a handler. What the fuck? <laughs> Come on, Brent. You gotta come harder as a comedian. They, I need a head and they come on. You put a pair of designer jeans and some hip sneakers and think you're cool. You're still a dork with a frat pro vocabulary. <laughs> Calling me and numerous people dummy, dumbass, fucking idiot. You need a reality check. You're surrounded by yes men. You're not special. You're not original. Every move you make is a copycat of you're both on steroids and dressed like assholes. Need I remind you, your origin story is a failed cardio kickboxing instructor who had two rich friends in high school to fund his business. Now go make a cool video, stay relevant, dummy. P.S. Quit stealing my shows on Big Boy Network and recreating them, okay? Oh my god, my uh, dude, listen. <laughs> we shit. I mean, what is all that about? Yeah, that was that was brilliant. As per usual, that was fucking brilliant. Big up Elephant Graveyard. Honestly, one of my favorites. Go check them out. Um, they need way more subs than they already have. Um, like, subscribe, click, all that good stuff because I'm a big fan of what they do, man. This is a sad thing. The Dissolution of Shaw. Please do check it out. Absolutely amazing, amazing channel. That was fucking fantastic. Big up them. Big up them.